Uh, hi everyone, welcome to the ACE online Spintronics seminar. Thank you for joining us. I hope you and your family are all doing well. This is Xin Fan from University of Denver. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Safir is the second speaker of this series that lives in Europe. So we are very grateful that he is giving this talk in his evening. Uh, Dr. Sophia, uh, Safir obtained his PhD from the laboratory of SpinTech in Grenoble, France. His PhD topic was spin orbit torque induced magnetic domain wall motion. Then he joined as a postdoc at CIC Nanoguin uh, in San Sebastian, Spain. In 2018, he obtained the uh, Maria Curie Fellowship from European Commission for his project proposal, spin transport and spin orbit phenomena in 2D materials, and is currently working on it. So today he will present some of the related results. Sophia, please. Um, uh, thank you for the kind intro introduction. And first of all, I would like to thank for this uh, online seminar series and also give me a chance to explain my experimental results. So the topic I'm going to talk today is uh, spin to charge conversion in one to watts materials, where I'm going to show you how to get spin orbit related uh, effects such as spin hall effect in 2D materials, for example, in graphene. And through this talk, I would like to give a flavor of how to do spin orbitronics using Wonder Watch materials. So let me start my presentation by explaining some of the basic concept of spintronics. Now I understand that this is a spintronics online seminar series and probably everybody are aware of these concepts, but I have to explain it to explain my research later in this, in this uh, presentation. So let me start by explaining the basic concept of spintronics, which is this concept of spin current. If you want to get spin current, what we have to do is that we have to just take a ferromagnet and apply a current across the ferromagnet. And the electrons that is coming out of the ferromagnet will be spin polarized, obviously depend on the magnetization direction of the ferromagnet. And this way we can get a spin polarized current. Now using this spin polarized current, we can get different kinds of applications. These are some of the examples. So in the first example, I show here the concept of spin transistor, which was proposed by Data and Das in 1990s. Here we have three different spintronics functions. We have spin injection, we have spin detection, and also spin transport. So here, a spin polarized current injected into this channel will be controlled by the gate voltage, and this will be later detected by another ferromagnetic detector. And probably the most famous example is in memory. So spin polarized current coming from a ferromagnet can be used to switch the magnetization of a magnetic bit in memory. So we call this as spin transfer torque memory. And similarly, there is proposal of making logic devices using spin polarized current. Now in all these uh, devices, we know that we use spin polarized current source is a ferromagnet. And we all know that uh, to use ferromagnet, uh, to integrate it into electronic devices, there is some disadvantages. Then we started asking the question, is it possible to get spin current from a material that is not ferromagnet? And the answer is yes, it is possible. For this, we have to use uh, spin orbit coupling material. And there are different phenomena that can uh, give you spin current from a spin orbit coupling material. I'm going to take here the most famous uh, example, which is spin hall effect. So spin hall effect generally occurs in materials with strong spin orbit coupling, uh, such as, for example, platinum or tantalum. Uh, ex excuse me, Safia, so sorry to interrupt. Uh, there's some people saying that they cannot hear you clearly. Would you please speak a little bit louder, please? Okay. Thank you. No problem. So for spin hall effect, uh, we have to apply uh, electrical current into a spin orbit coupling material. And in this material, the spins with opposite, electrons with opposite spins, they deflect along opposite direction. And because of that, we get a pure spin current that is flowing, uh, let's say, along this direction. And uh, one of the basic feature of uh, spin hall effect that I'll be explaining in this, uh, in the coming slides a lot is the symmetry of the spin hall effect. So according to the symmetry, the injected charge current, the spin current and the spin polarization, they should be mutually perpendicular to each other. That means here, if we apply a charge current, let's say along y direction, then we get a spin current along x direction with a spin polarization along z direction. 
Now, if you follow this symmetry, we can say that by applying a current along a single direction, we can get two kinds of uh, spin current. Let's say here we have horizontal spin current with out of plane spin polarization. And then we, we can also have a uh, out of plane spin current with the in plane spin polarization. Now, another important feature is that if a material has spin hall effect, it should also have inverse spin hall effect. That means if we now inject spin current into the system, then we can get a charge current. So we can call spin hall effect as charge to spin conversion and inverse spin hall effect as spin to charge conversion. Or from application point of view, you can say that a spin hall effect is the generation of spin current from charge current and inverse spin hall effect is the detection of spin current as charge current. Now the parameter that tells you the efficiency of spin hall effect is we call it spin hall angle, which is nothing but the ratio of how much spin current is generated with applied charge current. So to give you some numbers in platinum, it can be up to 23%, in tantalum it can be up to 35%. Now this number varies from uh, experiment to ex experiment. I am giving this number just to understand the uh, uh, range of the value that we will get. So now we can go back to all these basic devices and it has been already demonstrated in the literature. We can make all these devices now using spin orbit coupling materials. So there are proposal of uh, spin transistors by uh, uh, using spin orbit coupling material as spin injection and uh, detection uh, material. Then the most famous experiment uh, is obviously spin orbit torque where spin current uh, generated from a spin orbit coupling material can be used to switch the magnetization. Uh, and recently there is a proposal from Intel where they propose a logic device where they use spin to charge conversion as a detection method of the ferromagnetic magnetization. So historically, if you want, you can call this as fast generation spintronic devices and this as a new generation spintronic devices, or we can also call this as a spin orbitronics. Now, what I want to do in my experiment is that I want to do spintronics with uh, Van der Waals materials. And more precisely, I want to do spin orbitronics with Van der Waals materials. So let me now shift my discussion into the spintronics with these materials. So to explain Van der Waals materials, the easy way is to take an example. And the most famous example is obviously graphene. So graphene is the thinnest material that you can make. It get amazing properties. So it is useful for different applications in physics, in chemistry, in biology, everywhere. And structurally, it is just one layer of uh, uh, carbon atom and carbon atoms are arranged hexagonally. And graphene can be extracted from graphite. So graphite is nothing but many layers of graphene and each layer uh, is connected with the Van der Waals interaction. That's why we have this name Van der Waals materials. Now, after the discovery of graphene, there has been a lot of other Van der Waals material has been discovered and used for different applications. And these are some of the example. Here we have hexagonal boron nitride, which is an insulator. Then we have a transition metal dichalcogenate in short form we call TMD, which is based on transition metals such as molybdenum or tungsten. And one of the most famous example is topological insulator. And recently we have also 2D magnets. Now among all these Van der Waals materials, I, I took this as example because this can be some of the materials useful for spintronics applications. So from spintronics point of view, uh, we can say, for example, graphene is a weak spin orbit coupling material, so we can use it for such applications. HBN can be used as a tunnel barrier for spin injection and spin detection. TMDs are strong spin orbit coupling materials, so we can use for such applications. Topological insulator is famous because it has surface state and uh, spin polarized surface states. And recently in the last two, three years, there has been a lot of studies of getting ferromagnet very thin so that you can you know, get thin ferromagnets useful for magnetism and spintronics applications. So if we, uh, now talk about the spintronics with Van der Waals materials, I have to start from graphene. And the most famous use of graphene in spintronics is that it can be used as an excellent material for spin transport. This is mainly because graphene is made of carbon atoms, so it's a light atom, so it does not have strong spin orbit coupling. And because of that, if you inject spin current into graphene, it can be transported into long distances. 
So for example, the spin diffusion length in graphene has been measured up to from one micrometer to 100 micrometer. So for comparison in the normal metal, for example, copper, the maximum uh, length that you can get is one micrometer. So in the last many years, more than a decade, the major experimental effort in graphene was how to improve the spin transport properties of graphene. So these are some uh, examples of the experiment performed to improve the spin diffusion length, for example, in graphene. Now, all these different experiments were performed using this uh, device, this lateral spin valve. So in the case of lateral spin valve, we have a ferromagnet injector and detector, and it is connected with this graphene spin transport channel. And generally, the spin transport measurement uh, is done non-locally. That means if we inject the, uh, the charge current across this loop, which creates a spin accumulation at the interface of the ferromagnet and the graphene, and on the right side, we have a diffusion of pure spin current, so there is no local current is flowing there. And non-locally, we can measure a spin uh, voltage here in this uh, ferromagnet. Now, using the spin transport measurements, you can calculate the spin transport properties of graphene. Now, as I said before, what I want to do is that I want to introduce spin orbit uh, effects into the system. So for this, the device I'm going to use in, the, in my experiment is a little bit different from this. So here I'm going to keep one ferromagnet where I am sure that we have spin injection or detection. And one of the electrode I'm going to replace with the spin orbit coupling material. So now if the spin orbit coupling material, for example, if it have a spin hole effect, then you can have spin injection into graphene that can be detected by this ferromagnet as a voltage. And I can also do the reciprocal effect by exchanging the current and the voltage terminal. So if now if I apply current here, then the spin current will be injected from the ferromagnet to graphene that goes to the spin orbit coupling material. And if there is inverse spin hole effect, that creates a charge current that I can measure as a voltage. So experimentally, I can do both these experiments, but in my future slides, I will show you only this inverse spin hall effect experiment because it's easy to explain. So for the first time, such uh, experiment was performed in our group around three years ago, where we used the basic spin hall metal, which is, the, which is platinum, to inject or detect spin current uh, into graphene. So this is the first experiment that I'm going to explain in this, in this presentation. Now, after this work, we thought, what if we, if we change the platinum and we wanted to use a Van der Waals material to inject uh, spin current? So if you want spin hull effect in Van der Waals material, we have to go uh, for a Van der Waals material that has strong spin orbit coupling. So we have to go to this family, where, which is based on uh, molybdenum or tungsten. So these are heavy metals with a strong spin orbit coupling. Now the material that we used is molybdenum ditelluride, and we show that, okay, we can inject spin current now from this Van der Waals material to, to graphene. So this is the second experiment I will explain in this presentation. Now in these two experiments, we used graphene as a spin transport channel. So the next question I'm asking is that, is it possible that we can use graphene for spin injection and spin detection? That means we need spin to charge interconversion in graphene itself. So if you want spin charge conversion, for example, spin hull effect in graphene, then you need to induce spin orbit coupling in graphene. So what is the way to do it? So one way of doing it is using spin orbit proximity. So according to spin orbit proximity, if you take graphene and if you place the spin orbit coupling material on top of graphene, the place the graphene is touching with the spin orbit coupling material, we get spin orbit coupling in, in graphene. And because of that, you can have spin hull effect in this place where graphene has spin orbit coupling. So this is the next experiment that we did. So we showed that we can get spin hull effect in graphene using these two material. The first one is a molybdenum based material and the second one is a tungsten-based material. Now, the final experiment that I will show you today is almost the same experiment as here. So here we use the Van der Waals material to induce spin orbit coupling in graphene. Then the next question we ask is that, is it possible to induce spin orbit coupling in graphene by using the usual heavy metal-based resistance? So we use the Bismuth-based resistance, and we observe that we can have spin hull effect in graphene by just 
putting this uh, material on top. So step by step, uh, we starting from platinum, we reached having spin hall effect in graphene, and this is the story I want to tell you today. So first, let me start with the first experiment. It's about spin to charge conversion using graphene and platinum. So this is the real uh, image of our device we used. So this is SEM image, so we have a graphene channel. And auto, on top of graphene channel, we put different uh, ferromagnet. In our case, it was cobalt. And we also have platinum, which is uh, shown in blue color. Now I'm going to concentrate uh, on the experiment performed using these two electrodes, which is schematically shown uh, showed here. So according to this schematic diagram, initially we inject spin current from the ferromagnet, uh, where the ferromagnet is initially set along the easy axis direction, which is along Y axis. And the spin polarization injected will also have the same spin polarization. And then this spin polarized current will be uh, injected into the top material, which is platinum in our case. And if there is inverse spin hall effect, we will measure a voltage across this material. Now, as I mentioned before, this has to follow the symmetry. That means here, the spin current is going vertically along Z direction into the platinum. We are going to measure charge current along Y direction. That means this spin polarization should be along X direction. So to make it along X direction, I have to apply a large magnetic field along this X direction that will change the magnetization of the ferromagnet along this direction. And now if I do this measurement at large magnetic field, I am going to get a non-zero voltage. Please note that we, I am showing here uh, the inverse spin hall effect resistance. This is nothing but the voltage that we are measuring here divided by or normalized by the constant current that we apply for our experiment. So basically this resistance is uh, proportional to the voltage that we are measuring. Now, if I apply now the magnetic field along the negative direction, then the spin current is going and going to get saturated along the negative direction when the magnetization is saturated along the negative direction. So this confirms that when we change the spin polarization, the signal also changed. So this tells you that there is a spin to charge conversion. Now here I change the magnetization from plus X to minus X by rotating the, the magnetization along one easy axis, let's say minus Y easy axis, but I can do the other way also. So I can rotate it along plus Y easy axis. Then also I get uh, the same kind of signal, which again tells you that it follows this symmetry. Now after this experiment, the next thing we did is that we measured this at different temperature. And here I plot the amplitude of the signal that we obtained. So here this black curve corresponds to the amplitude of the signal at different temperature in our system, in our graphene platinum system. Now in the same plot, we also plot uh, the similar experiment performed using the usual metallic system like uh, co copper or, uh, or silver. So these are so small, so we have to zoom it. And this is shown in this inset. And you can clearly see that the signal that we are getting in graphene platinum is much higher than at least two order higher than the usually reported signals in, uh, in the usual uh, metallic system. And this is mainly because in graphene, we have excellent spin transport properties so that we have large spin current injected to platinum so that we have a large voltage. So now from this, we, we confirm that, okay, we can inject spin current efficiently into graphene. And the next thing we want to do is that we want to use this device to characterize our spin hull material, for example, here, uh, platinum. So whenever we talk about the efficiency of a spin hull material, the first thing is uh, spin hull angle. So in our case, it was 23 percentage. Now, there is another uh, parameter which is equally important as spin hull angle when you talk about the efficiency of spin hull effect material, which is the spin... Uh, diffusion length. So here, the voltage that we are getting will be proportional to spin hull angle, also on spin diffusion length. Now, to show you the importance of the spin diffusion length, let me take an example. Consider that in platinum, we had initially, let's say we have two nanometer of uh, spin diffusion length, then the spin to charge conversion of course only in this length or only in this area. But instead of two nanometer, now if we have four nanometer, then we have a large spin charge conversion of course all on all these uh, areas. That means we will have large voltage. 
So when we talk about the efficiency of spin hull effect, we have to actually talk about the product of spin hull angle with spin diffusion length. And this length we calculated in our system was 0.48 nanometer, which is 23 percentage of 2.1 nanometer. And this is the value we are getting at room temperature. Now to give you a comparison, the best spin to charge conversion material so far is topological insulator, the maximum length. In their case, it was Edelstein length. This length was around 2.1 nanometer. The best one is in the 2D electron system and it was uh, around 6.4 nanometer. So in platinum, obviously this is a bit smaller. So the takeaway message that we can uh, understand from this experiment is that first of all, we could uh, show for the first time that we can inject or detect spin current from a spin orbit coupling material to graphene. Secondly, we can use this uh, system as a tool to study spin to charge conversion effect like uh, spin hull effect. Now keeping this in mind, let me move into my second experiment where we used a wonder what's material in our case, it was molybdenum ditelluride to inject or detect uh, spin current. Now, the first question you may ask me is why I'm using a molybdenum ditelluride. So there are two points. The first thing is that there are theoretical uh, prediction which says that we can have large spin hole effect or spin hole conductivity in molybdenum ditelluride with relatively long spin diffusion length. And second, and an important point is there is a possibility of having unconventional spin to charge conversion in molybdenum ditelluride. Now, what I mean by unconventional spin to charge conversion? So, so far, multiple times in the last slide, I was explaining about the symmetry where the spin current, the spin polarization, and the charge current should be perpendicular to each other. Now, the symmetry of this spin hull effect or spin to charge conversion is generally connected with the symmetry of the crystal. That means if you take platinum, for example, it is a perfectly cubic system where the three mirrors are symmetric to each other. Then we have this kind of uh, symmetry requirement for the spin hull effect. But now if you go to a low symmetry crystal, for example, molybdenum ditelluride, so here we have only one mirror symmetry. So in this case, in this material, such symmetry can be lifted. For example, there was a study in 2016, for example, in tungsten ditelluride, which has almost the same structure as molybdenum ditelluride. It was, it was a spin orbital measurement where they observed that along with the conventional perpendicular symmetry, there is also spin orbital due to the spin current that is going along out of plane direction, where the spin polarization was parallel, again, along the out of plane direction. So before doing this experiment, we have to consider these two possibilities and keeping in that mind, let me go into my experiment. So here is our real device. So there is a graphene channel here, which is very thin. I hope it is visible. And then we have different uh, ferromagnets connected on the top of the channel and also gold conducts to apply current and measure voltage. Here in green color, we have our molybdenum ditelluride flake. So I, again, I'm going to explain the experiment performed here, which is schematically shown here. Now, similar to the experiment that we did in platinum, we applied a magnetic field along the X direction by rotating the magnetization along plus EZ axis and minus EZ axis. And this is the signal that we are getting in the molybdenum ditelluride. Now, if you want to compare this with the signal that we got in platinum, you can clearly see that there is some difference. So in the case of platinum, it was not depending on how it is rotating along the easy axis, but here you can see that the two cases are different. Now, when we looked into this in details, we saw that this overall signal constitute of two contribution. One is an anti-symmetric contribution. So it's a signal which is anti-symmetric to the magnetic field. And this signal look like almost same as platinum with a sign reversed, of course. And we can say that this is a spin charge in the conversion due to the spin along X direction. Now, along with this signal, in this overall signal, there was another component, which is a symmetric component. So it was symmetric with respect to magnetic field. And here, the maximum was when the spin polarization was along the easy axis. So this signal is a summation of these two signals. 
That means in this material, we have uh, two spin to charge conversion. The first one in the usual symmetry where all these three parameters are perpendicular to each other. In the second case, we have an unconventional spin to charge conversion where the charge current is parallel to the spin polarization. So this is very unique and never been observed before. And because of this, you can get, for example, if you apply a charge current along one in-plane direction, you can get spin current with spin polarization along multiple direction within the plane. Now, since this is a new observation, we have to confirm that this is not an artifact. So we perform different control experiment to confirm that this is really occurring in the system. And I'm not going to the details of this uh, experiment. If you want, you can look into this paper and do, uh, doing this kind of different uh, experiments, we confirm that we are actually measuring a spin to charge conversion with this symmetry. Now, once we, we understand that, okay, we have these two spin to charge conversion, the next thing what we want to do is to tell or calculate what is the efficiency in this system. So in the earlier case, when I had platinum, platinum is a well-known system where we knew what is the spin hole angle and what is the possible spin diffusion length. But since molybdenum ditelluride is a relatively new system for spin hull effect, we don't know what are these parameters. So we cannot tell exactly what is the, uh, the efficiency in this case, but we can tell that we are measuring a voltage, a spin to charge conversion voltage here. So we can tell what is the minimum value of these, these parameters to get the voltage that we are measuring here. And this minimum value in the conventional case was around 1.15 nanometer, the multiplication of the spin diffusion length to spin hard angle. And in the unconventional case, we got around 0.5 nanometer. Now this is the minimum value, so the value can be anything about this. Now, please note that this value is much larger than platinum or uh, tantalum, and it's comparable to some of the topological insulator. And this one was as strong as uh, the case in, the, uh, in platinum. So this also strong. So the takeaway message from this experiment is that, first of all, we have a molybdenum ditelluride which has a large spin to charge conversion efficiency. And secondly, we have spin to charge conversion with a multi-directional uh, spin polarization. So with this, let me move into the second part of my experiment where we show that we can have spin hall effect in graphene. So one way of getting a spin hall effect in graphene is due to proximity effect. Now let me explain what is proximity effect. So proximity effect is when a material is in contact with another material. So a material gets the properties of its neighboring material in a place where they are in contact with each other. So the first feature about proximity effect is it is unlike doping, there is, in the case of doping, there will be a chemical change in the host material, but here there are no chemical changes. And second point is that uh, proximity effect can be important in 2D materials compared to bulk materials. This is mainly because the effect decays over a characteristic length. So in bulk material, you can imagine that the effect will be very strong uh, on the top surface. But since 2D material, if you want, you can imagine it is a surface itself, this effect can be very strong. Now in literature, you can get different kinds of proximity. You can get magnetic proximity, spin orbit proximity, you can get proximity effect due to superconductors, and also you can get proximity induced uh, topological phases. Now with this proximity, you can imagine now that you can take one material and give whatever properties you want in a place wherever you want. So this effect can be very important for future application, or we can say that this can be next level of material engineering. Now, the proximity effect can solve one of the basic material problem that we have in spintronics. So in, in spintronics, we have certain effects which requires weak spin orbit coupling, for example, spin transport. And then there are certain effects, for example, spin hull effect, which requires strong spin orbit coupling. And it's impossible to get all this effect in a single material. But now, for example, if you have graphene, which does not have a strong spin orbit coupling into it, in it, and if you if we can induce spin orbit coupling in this in this system, then we can get all these different spintronics phenomena in a single material. So this is what I want to do. So 
The question I am going to ask here is that, is it possible to get spin orbit coupling proximity in graphene? And because of that, can we get a spin hall effect? Now, theory says, yes, it is possible to get spin hall effect in graphene. And what I'm going to show you is the experimental demonstration of this theoretical prediction. Now, before going to the experiment, I just want to mention one unique property of spin hall effect in graphene, according to the theoretical calculation. In graphene, it is, uh, since it is a Dirac material, you can change the Fermi level using a gate voltage. And theory shows that depending on what spin orbit coupling material you take, the spin hull conductivity can be tuned by applying a gate voltage or by changing the Fermi level. And even you can change the sign of the spin hull conductivity. That means you can change the sign of the spin hull angle by applying a gate voltage. So this is very unique for graphene compared to platinum or other system, which is not possible to change the spin hall angle with a gate voltage. Now, keeping this in mind, uh, let me explain my experiment. So here now I have a device which is a little bit different from the previous case. So in the previous case, I had only a graphene spin transport channel, but here I have a graphene hall bar. In the middle of the hall bar, I'm going to put my spin orbit coupling material, which is in my case, it was molybdenum disulfide. Then in the usual way, I'm going to inject spin current from a ferromagnet, and I'm going to measure the voltage ac across this uh, graphene stripe, which is vertical to, to the channel. If, if now I inject spin current, then this spin current is going to reach in the spin orbit proximitized region of graphene along this direction, along horizontally. So this is a little bit different from the platinum case. So in the case of platinum, we had the spin current entering into the top material along vertical direction, but here it is uh, reaching along horizontal direction. That means if we now follow this uh, symmetry, then here we have spin current along X, uh, charge current along Y, then the spin polarization to get a voltage here should be along Z or along out of plane direction. Now, the question is that how can I get uh, out of plane spin polarized current reaching here? Because here I have an in plane uh, ferromagnetic injector. So, for this, I, I use a little trick. So, what I do is that I apply a small magnetic field. So, this is a magnetic field not strong enough to change the magnetization along this hard axis. That means the spin now will be injected still in the easy axis. And when this spin sees this perpendicular magnetic field, according to the precession equation given here, it is going to precess around this field. Now this precession will have an out of plane component. And if there is inverse spin hall effect in graphene, there will be a voltage that is proportional to this out of, out of plane component. Now that signal should be proportional to the spin precession. So it will be an oscillating signal. And this signal should disappear at large field. So at large field, what happens is that this field will pull the magnetization parallel to it, so there is no precession, so the signal goes to zero. Now, if I reverse the magnetic field now, then the precession is again going to reverse. So in the negative side, I'm going to get a negative precession signal. Now, similarly, I can perform the experiment here. I set the magnetization initially along one easy axis. I can also set it in another easy axis. Now, this signal is now going to be opposite to, to the previous uh, signal that we get. So by doing this control experiment, and if I get this signal, I can confirm that there is an out of plane spin to charge conversion in the system. And because of that, uh, I can confirm that there is inverse spin hull effect in the system. So this is the real device. So this is an optical image. And here, actually, you can see that I made two hull bars. So the blue thing is graphene. So we have a hall bar where we have only graphene and there is another hall bar and where on top of graphene, I stamped a molybdenum disulfide uh, flake. And this hall bar I'm going to use as a reference and this is where I'm going to perform my spin to charge conversion experiment. So the first experiment I do is that I measure the spin to charge conversion like experiment here in this reference. And this is the signal I am getting with respect to the magnetic field. Now I change the experiment into this branch where I have both graphene and also MOS2. Then the signal I'm getting is completely different. So this signal look like a spin precession signal. 
Now to confirm that this is in precession signal, I can uh, set the initial magnetization to negative direction. Then I see that, okay, the signal is reversed. So this signal is nothing but a spin precession signal with a linear background that we have in the reference. Now, if I subtract these two curves, I can remove the linear background and I get a pure spin precession signal. So I have a signal which is proportional to the out-of-plane spin. And this confirms that we have spin Hall effect now in graphene. Now, this spin precession signal can be fitted into, into an equation and we can extract the efficiency of spin Hall effect in, uh, in graphene. So this was an experiment that we performed last year. And after this experiment, we thought that what is the way to improve the efficiency in this material? So we, uh, we did three approaches. The first one was to change the TMD material. So here we used the molybdenum based material, but we know that tungsten has larger spin orbit coupling. So we decided to do experiment using tungsten diselenide in our case. Then we also performed the experiments by varying temperature. Then uh, the next experiment we did is something that I mentioned in the, in the beginning where we know that theoretically we know that we can tune this spin hall effect in graphene by a gate voltage. So this is the next experiment that we did. And I'm going to show you these experiments here. So initially we studied inverse spin hall effect now in tungsten diselenide graphene system. And we again got a spin precision like signal. And then we studied it with temperature. So we saw that by lowering the temperature, so we went up to 10K, we can increase the signal. Then the next thing that we did is to study the spin hall effect, inverse spin hall effect by applying a gate voltage. So here we have uh, the blue curve where the, there is no gate voltage applied. And when we applied a plus five voltage, we saw that we can uh, make this into charge conversion to zero. So we can turn off the conversion. But if we now apply minus five voltage, we can um, amplify the signal. That means by applying a small uh, electric field, we can now play with the spin to charge conversion. And this is very unique uh, in, in graphene. Now uh, fitting these data into the model, we can calculate the efficiency. So here I show the room temperature efficiency in this system. So this was around five nanometer. So this itself is big. But if we go to low temperature and now I apply a gate voltage that amplify the signal, then the, this efficiency length can go into very, very large value. So we can get up to 40 nanometer. So this shows that graphene is not only a spin charge conversion system, it is also a system with large efficiency. So with this, let me conclude my work with the spin hall effect in graphene. So here we showed that graphene, which was used for weak spin orbit coupling related effects, we can also use it for effects which require strong spin orbit coupling, for example, spin hall effect. So this is an important result. Then, and then we show that we can tune this spin hall effect by applying a gate voltage, which is very unique for graphene. And then we show that uh, the efficiency by tuning uh, it with voltage and, and temperature, we can go to these record values. All right, now uh, let me go into my last study, which is about how to get spin hall effect in graphene by putting uh, bismuth oxide on top. So this is the system that we have. So here we have again a uh, graphene hole boss. In these two hole boss, I put my material, which is bismuth oxide, which was around five nanometer. And the first question you may ask why I use bismuth oxide. So the reason is, first of all, it has been already used for uh, spin to charge conversion measurements by combining with uh, normal metal copper. So this was a work from 2016. And from our group, there is another work where we used this material when it combined with copper we found that it can induce interfacial skew scattering that was actually changing the anomalous Hall effect in cobalt. So with these studies, we know that there is a chance if we put bismuth oxide on top of graphene, we can get a spin to charge conversion. And this is the experiment that we did exactly same as the previous experiment. And this is the room temperature measurement where we observe the spin precession signal. And again, it is reversible if we reverse the initial magnetization direction. Then we also performed a different temperature and you can see that again, like last case, we increased the, the signal by decreasing the temperature. 
And then we did the maths and we found that the length, the efficiency here can be 3.5 nanometer. This is again a big value. Now there are two points uh, which I need to mention to highlight the importance of this study. One is related to the physics of the spin hull effect in graphene. Another one is related to the application. Now from the physics point of view, if you look into the theories of uh, spin hull effect in graphene, you can get spin hull effect used uh, because of two mechanisms. The first mechanism is due to proximity effect. So in this case, the TMD material, theoretically, and also it has different uh, type of spin orbit coupling, let's say intrinsic spin orbit coupling, Rashba type, and the type that uh, creates uh, out of plane spin uh, texture in graphene is valism and spin orbit coupling. So if you go to the theory of spin hall effect here, uh, it will tell you that the valism and spin orbit coupling is the main mechanism that gives uh, spin hall effect in graphene. So here we combine the two Van der Waals materials together. So it becomes a single proximitized material. And here we get spin hull effect due to the changes in the band structure of the graphene. So if you want, you can call this as the intrinsic mechanism. But then there is another mechanism. So in this mechanism, according to these theories, if you take graphene and if you grow islands of uh, spin orbit coupling material, you can get skew scattering and because of that you can get spin hull effect. So maybe if you want, you can call it as the extrinsic mechanism. So in our graphene bismuth oxide, uh, we conclude that it is very unlikely that we have valisium and spin orbit coupling. So the most probable case is this, the skew scattering. So maybe you can say that this was the first type of spin hull effect and this is the extrinsic type of uh, spin hull effect. And the second point is the, what is the advantage of this material compared to the previous material? So if you take a different spin charge conversion measurement in literature, in all these ex different experiments, people generally use uh, graphene combined with either with a metal or semiconductor. So here, even if you have a spin to charge conversion, still this top material can interact with the charge transport or spin transport. But here, Bismuth oxide, it's an oxide, it's an insulator. So what it does, it stays there and it gives spin orbit coupling into graphene. So it does not interfere with the charge and spin transport. So everything occurs in graphene only. So this can be important if you want large charge densities or uh, spin densities in graphene, which is very important for application. And second point is uh, from purely from an experimental point of view. So if you work with these wonder Walls materials, you know that to make a scalable devices by using two Van der Waals materials is very difficult. But here you can take a graphene and you can deposit whatever size you want, the bismuth oxide, whatever size you want. And also you can make multiple devices on the same substrate. So this also has importance for application. So to summarize, uh, I showed you two studies, uh, four studies, where I started from uh, the platinum study where we showed that we can inject uh, from a spin orbit coupling material spin, spin current into graphene. And I showed that it can be used as a tool to study spin to charge conversion. In the second study, I showed uh, spin charge conversion in molybdenum and telluride, where we got large efficiency and also we had spin to charge conversion with the polarization in different directions. And this study might be the most important study from us where we showed that we can have spin hull effect in graphene. And this spin hull effect is electrically tunable and the efficiency is very large. And recently we also see that we can get spin hull effect in graphene by combining it with an insulator. And here the origin of spin hull effect can be extrinsic. So from uh, purely from a material point of view, here we used a metal, a semi-metal, a semiconductor, and an insulator. So in all these cases, we have a efficient spin to charge conversion. And uh, overall, the main result was graphene, which was used only for uh, experiments where re we require weak spin orbit coupling, such as spin transport. Now we can use graphene for spin transport, we can use spin for a spin injection, and also for uh, spin detection. So we can do all these different spintronic uh, phenomena in a single material. So this was the 
important result from this project. With this, I want to, before finishing, I want to acknowledge the people involved in this work. So this is our group, Nano Device Group in Nano Gune. So I want to acknowledge my supervisor, Dr. Felix Casanova and Professor Luis Herso, and three important people who worked in this project. First, Franz Herling, who did experiments with me on a spin hall effect uh, study in graphene. Nerea Undoso, she worked on the molybdenum ditelluride project. And we have Joseph, who did most of the analysis and mathematics. He is also a postdoc like me in, in the group. And I also want to acknowledge my collaborators, so a previous member in our group, Reyes Calvo, now is in Alicante, and the theoreticians from a neighboring lab from DIPC, theoreticians from uh, ICN Barcelona, and also collaborators from ETH Zurich. I also want to acknowledge my uh, different funding, especially the funding that I'm getting from uh, European Commission. With this, I want to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Safia, for the very exciting talk. Uh, let's send a, a round of virtual applause by clicking the reactions button at the bottom of the Zoom screens. And uh, we're now taking questions. Um, please use the raise hand options. To do that, please click the participants at the bottom of our screen and then click raise hand in the pop-up menu. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if I can pronounce your name correctly. Najar, please go ahead with your question. Hi. Uh, hi, Safir. Uh, that was a very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, I'm Najar from Northeastern University. Um, so um, you uh, mentioned there are uh, two possible effects uh, in uh, the bismuth oxide sample and molybdenum di ditelluride. Uh, one is the proximity effect and another is skew scattering. Mm -hmm. uh, can you elaborate on uh, how to experimentally isolate the two? Uh, what did you do to experimentally isolate these two effects? Um, the easy answer is not possible. So if you take uh, any system, any spin hall effect system, for example, platinum or tantalum, there can be intrinsic effect or extrinsic effect. So experimentally, it is not possible to 100% say that this is the mechanism. Mm -hmm. But what we can say is that this is the possible mechanism. Right. So if you look into the theory of, uh, of uh, graphene, spin hall effect in graphene, so there is theories on graphene TMD, and there are no theories I see on intrinsic mechanism using graphene bismuth oxide. But from the experimental point of view, uh, here, the theory says that we need something called Valley-Zeeman coupling, which only occurs in TMDs, not in bismuth oxide. This is the main mechanism, according to the theory, that gives you spin hall effect, intrinsic spin hall effect in graphene. And we, are, we know that this is not going to occur in bismuth oxide, but this does not mean that there can be other mechanism which we don't know. But the most probable case in our case is, we think, is this, but we cannot say this 100% like any system. Okay. And uh, another thing that from experiment, by doing experiment, this ha has been like graphene TMD is generally very reproducible. So when you put the system, like a TMD system on top of graphene, they, they attach with the Van der Waals uh, interaction. So there uh, to have an extrinsic mechanism for, for that, you need somehow the spin orbit coupling atom to go to graphene, for example. This is very unlikely, and most of the experiment that we do, this effect, the spin hall effect in this in this material system is very reproducible. But here we see that it depends on the way that we are doing. I mean, it is not as reproducible, so it, it is very depend on the growth of the of the bismuth oxide. So this is why we are thinking that maybe this is coming also from this growth of islands of bismuth or bismuth oxide in our system. But I think I don't think that experimentally we can say that this is hundred percent. We can say you know, what is the most probable case. Okay, all right, thank you. Any other question? Uh, let me let me ask ask actually uh, two quick questions. Uh, the first one is uh, both related to the uh, proximity effect of the TMD on graphene. In your experiment, um, uh, the the structure requires the spin to be out of plane, and uh, but that the when the spin propagates in graphene, it actually can also diffuse through TMD. So how 
can you are you sure that the the voltage signal you get is from graphene through proximity effect rather than the just the spin current that flows through the TMD? And a, a related question, um, it's a great idea to use the um, precession, but you also suffer from uh, defacing to generate out of plane spin. Uh, just the experimentally, why is you cannot uh, just simply apply out of plane magnetic field? Okay, so let me show you a slide to explain the first experiment. Okay, so this is the three different possibilities, as you mentioned, that you can have spin charge conversion in our system. So the first possibility is spin hall effect in graphene. Then actually you can also have Rajpar Delstein effect. And then you can also have, as you mentioned, you can have spin hall effect in, in the TMD on the top. But we can isolate this because, you know, for the case of the, if the top, there is been charge conversion in the top material, then it will be uh, proportional to the in-plane spin component. And if you do now the experiment with the in-plane field, you will get this kind of signal. But for the case of uh, spin hall effect in graphene, it should be proportional to the out-of-plane spin. So in this case, you are going to get this kind of signal. So by simply checking if, it, if you are getting in plane spin charge conversion or out of plane spin charge conversion, you know that this is coming from graphene or this is coming from the top material. So this is purely from the symmetry of the, of the experiment. And then the second question was, sorry. Uh, uh, the second question was, uh, 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 why can't you just apply out of plane magnetic field? Why so do out of plane, if we want, we can apply, but even though this is a non-local measurement, there can be an, a small current that can uh, leak into this area and that can give you a signal. And graphene has magneto resistance. And if you apply out of plane field, this magneto resistance is larger. So if we do the measurement we tried, but the magneto resistance is so large, it's in ohms and kilo ohms, so that we don't see the spin share conversion signal. So we can do it. But this, is, this itself is enough because we have a precession measurement. I think that is the best measurement to confirm that it is uh, proportional to the spin polarization. You can do it, but you know, due to artifacts, it is not possible experimentally. I see. Thank you. And I think uh, Kelly Lo, please go ahead with your question. Hi, uh, Sakura. This is Kelly Law from Cornell. So just on the slides, the in inverse spin hole effect in most two, uh, I don't quite understand why the spin needed to be the in-plane direction, because in MOS2, the spin should be only on the outer plane. So can you explain further how this in-plane no, no, no. So it's not that uh, in, in MOS2, you can have in-plane and out-of-plane spins. But according to the symmetry of what we are doing here, if you want uh, the spin to charge conversion, the spin has to go from the graphene vertically into MOS2. So if you have a vertical spin current and if there is a spin to charge conversion, so vertical spin current will give you voltage if the spin is along in plane direction. If you have a spin along out of plane direction, it will not give you a signal. So since we are measuring a signal, the out of planes should come, spin should come from graphene, not from MOS2. Even if you have uh, out of plane spin in MOS2, it will not give you a signal according to the symmetry. Okay, but in your second graph here, say if you have out of plane spin, that this red arrow also propagated in the MOS2, then you also measure the same voltage signal, right? Because inverse spin hole effect. No, you cannot, I mean, uh, the spin has to go from, so the spin is injected initially in graphene. So I don't know this, this drawing is good or not, but it goes to the graphene below, then it goes to, goes to the MOS2. You know, it is not able to jump you know, horizontally into, graph, into MOS2. So maybe there is some from that, just a little bit, but most of the case it goes up. And there is also another experiment. If you want, I can show you to confirm that this is from graphene. So if I go to, sorry. Uh, so the, the, uh, the control experiment that we can do is that we can do the measurement by applying from negative uh, direction. So we can put a ferromagnet from uh, left side of the MOS2 and we can measure the spin charge conversion by applying the, the spin current from the right side of the, of the uh, MOS2. Mm -hmm. And in this case, if it is coming from graphene, the spin current is going to reach 
uh, along the opposite direction, then the signal will reverse. If it is coming from the top material, the spin current direction is again along vertical direction. Does not matter if you inject spin current from left or right. And by doing this control experiment, also we can understand it is coming from graphene or MOS2. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Yanko, please with your, go ahead with your question. Yeah. Um, uh, hi, this is Yanko Mir. I have a simple question, I guess. Uh, what guides you what kind of material to put uh, because uh, I mean for the proximity effects okay they're not chemical uh, but they are effects and if you put practically anything next to graphene there will be some proximity effect so my question is what guides you what material to put given what you want to achieve so uh so in the case of, you know, it's again about the question is that can you put anything on top of graphene and get a spin orbit proximitized? Maybe not. So if it, as, as I was explaining in the mechanism, if you want intrinsic mechanism, maybe we need certain type of uh, material, for example, TMDs. So TMDs we can put on top. But this is what I was saying, bismuth oxide, maybe by just putting on bismuth oxide on top of it, maybe we are not going to get spin orbit coupling. So this is why maybe because of the growth and because it grow in the islands, maybe we have spin hall effect. So it's not necessary that we, we can put anything and we can get. But we know that from the theory, if you take this TMD, which is a Van der Waals material, which has this spin orbit coupling, and theory says that if you put this material on top of graphene, you get spin hall effect. So this was the initial experiment that we did. Bismuth oxide, we just uh, tried with, the, you know, uh, it's an insulator and it was interesting. And then we observed the, of the spin hall effect. Now we can try different materials. It may be there, maybe it is small, it's big, we never know. So this is just, uh, we have to try. All right, is there any other question? Uh, Yaroslav, please go ahead with your question. MOS2 was measured just by itself to produce spin orbit and what were the results and the second related to it question is uh, if you put the same MOS2 on copper for example would you expect to see same kind of proximity and same kind of effects with just copper wire instead of graphene under it um, so let me show you uh, uh, a detailed uh, experimental results that we got. So we actually got uh, this signal and when we look into the details of it, we get this signal and also in background there was a signal which is the linear slope and this look like a signal which is corresponds to the in-plane spin to charge conversion. Now when you have in-plane spin to charge conversion, this can be either Rashba effect in graphene or at the interface, but graphene itself is interface or it can be the spin to charge conversion in MOS2. So we don't know it, and MOS2 is a semiconductor material, or maybe the spin is not injected very well, or maybe it is small. So it is possible that we can have spin to charge conversion in, in MOS2, but maybe we are not observing it, or it's very difficult to inject spin into it, or maybe it's very small. So MOS2 is possible to get it. But what we are observing is the one in graphene, which is the, let's say, dominant one. And your second question was, sorry. Oh, <clears throat> the second question was, uh, if you put MOS2 on copper, for example. Yeah, so it d depends on uh, copper get proximitized or not. So maybe the top surface will proximitize. It's not a 2D material, so maybe there is some effect. So maybe it's small or big. So I don't know copper get proximitized by putting uh, TMD, but we know that you know, graphene is a 2D material, so the proximity effect is stronger there, so we get a strong signal from it. Thank you. Uh, Yanko, you have another question? Please go ahead. Yes, uh, if you don't mind, I have another simple question. So um, you showed these numbers that are probably very important, uh, uh, namely, I do remember the half nanometer, and then you had 1.1 nanometer diffusion length. Uh, 
spin diffusion length. So uh, this is like very few interatomic distances in my mind, I'm failing to remember what are the, the interatomic distance, but it's, it's just a few interatomic distances. So ideally, what is your hope? How far can you get with this type of, uh, it's actually four settings you showed, like you emphasized the conclusion. What, do you have some uh, uh, figure on your mind that you would like to see some number for the spin diffusion length? No, so uh, uh, I don't know you're talking about platinum or monotelluride graphene. So if you think about graphene, which has the largest number, so in graphene actually happens is that, so whenever you have a spin hall effect system, you have spin hall conversion efficiency where charge current is converted into spin current. And then the important thing is that how long, how much length, which is a spin diffusion length, this conversion occurs, that will give you large numbers, large voltage or large spin current at the end. So in graphene, actually what is happening is that the conversion efficiency might be same as platinum, for example, 10% or 5% or 20 percentage. But graphene is a very good spin transport material. No? It, it has originally, it has like one micrometer length. And when you put a spin orbit coupling material on top, it reduces the spin uh, diffusion length, not up to like uh, in platinum, it was just one or two nanometer, but it reduces, but it still stays in 100 or two, in, the, in the range of 100 nanometers, the spin diffusion length. So we have a spin to conversion you know, 10% or whatever, over these long distances, that gives us the large value. So now it is around, in graphene, it's around 100 nanometers, the spin diffusion length. Now, uh, depending on how good you can make graphene, you can increase this value. In our case, we are just exfoliating graphene. It is not the best graphene, but there are ways to improve the spin diffusion length in graphene by encapsulating it with a different material. So this way you can go into large values. But now we are in 100 nanometers. So I cannot say a number, but maybe it can go to very large numbers. Oh, okay, so apparently I, I may have misinterpreted some of the numbers you showed, but I, I can just watch again uh, what you showed. Thank you very much. The next question will be given, asked by uh, Saul Valence. Please unmute and uh, go ahead with your question. Yeah, thanks, Safir, for the very nice talk. So my question is regarding the unconventional spin-to-charge conversion in molybdenum detelluride. So is that because of the, um, of the crystal symmetry of the, of the material or is because of the thickness? So would you expect the same on, in bilayers and monolayers? So can you elaborate a bit more on this? No, actually we had a bulk material. So we had a 10 nanometer, 11 nanometer material. So I don't know how this effect, this effect can be of get from the crystal structure, but the problem is that we cannot go low temperature because molytelluride has some electrical property that depends on the thickness. So I don't know what is happening in lower uh, uh, thickness. In lower thickness, it says that it goes uh, ambipolar. In some thickness, it is like there are studies saying that it's semiconductor. So the material that we are showing here is bulk. Okay, thanks. It is uh, 10, 11, and yeah. Uh, Stephen will ask the next question. Please go ahead. Uh, very nice talk. Thank you very much. I have also a question to your understanding of the proximity effect uh, of the molybdenum ditolerite on 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 uh, graphene. So when I think about proximity, uh, I personally think the way that everything is encoded in the wave function. So I have a wave function. The wave function picks up either some magnetism or it picks up uh, some spin orbit effect then uh, the wave function travels to another place, uh, picks up something there, and, and gets, after all, all, all the information spread. And uh, so when I think about these van der Waals bonded systems, then I think uh, usually that uh, somehow I have kind of a gap region, and not really a gap, but uh, the, the resistance between graphene and uh, molybdenum ditelluride is quite large. It means the electron have a hard time maybe to go to the, to go to the other side and picks up maybe the spin orbit effect there and comes back. And uh, so that therefore I would have thought, ah, this proximity, this spin orbit related proximity effect is not so easy to get from this molybdenum ditolerite into the graphene, but obviously has shown uh, quite different. So do you have a, somehow a personal understanding or personal view or a personal um, understanding of this? 
So, I mean, proximity effect uh, is stronger when it is proximitized. So whenever you put uh, two materials in close to each other, the proximity effect really depends on how close they are for sure. So in a Van der Waals material, when we make this, uh, this material, there is a gap, as you said, there is a Van der Waals gap. So the proximity effect, according to theory and everything, it occurs only on the top surface. So as you say, it should decay over the distance, but still with the gap that we have, we can still get the proximity spin orbit proximity in graphene. So if you have multi-layer, maybe you have only the proximity on the top of it. So proximity decays anyway, but uh, according to the experiment and theory that we do, it says that at least on the top surface, okay, if we have graphene, which is only one surface, this can get into, or this can get into the system. But if you have, for example, in experiment, we did a stamping and the gap is a bit larger, maybe we don't have the proximity effect. So it really depends on the gap. And generally, when we have this Van der Waals gap, which is the thickness of, you know, uh, Armstrong or nanometers, we get the proximity effect. But uh, in the, previously, um, uh, an, an another speaker, or another person asked a question about uh, on copper. Uh, I yeah. think in copper you don't have a van der Waals gap, then the effect should be stronger. What do you think? So it depends on uh, if the band structure is changed and maybe it has, because it's a bulk material, maybe it has there in the top. I don't know, because there are some you know, proximity effect in platinum and all this kind of thing. So I don't know if it happens in copper or not. Mm -hmm. in copper may be there, but even if it is there, it will be on the top surface and maybe it's not strong enough mm -hmm. to get the proximity. But I don't know if it is there or not. Okay. Maybe you make it thinner, maybe you'll see it. I don't know. Okay. I see. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any other question? <clears throat> okay. If there's no other question, I want to thank the speaker again, and I want to thank all of you for participating.